So today we're, we're going to start a new series, y'all. And I'm super excited about this new series. It's leading right into our Easter Sunday, which is going to be happening in about three or four weeks. So um, I'm really excited about what God's going to do through this particular series. So I want you to take advantage and don't wait till Easter. Start inviting folks now to be a part of this journey that we're going to start on today. And um, if maybe they missed today's message, you just refer them to our YouTube page, uh, which is Restoration Worship TV, just all one word. And um, it'll be up there in the next couple of days. But we're going to get started. We're going we're gonna to start this new series called Damaged But Still Good. Damaged But Still Good. I don't know if you've ever heard of the phrase damaged goods, right? It's, it's funny that they, they don't stop being goods, although they're damaged. They're still goods. And so we're going to get into it. If you could be on your feet again. And I'm going to read from one of the most feared books in the Bible besides the book of Revelation. The second most feared book in the Bible is Leviticus. <laughs> Stay with me. Promise you. I promise you I will take you to a safe place. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 21 verse 21. We're just going to read two verses. We're just going to read verses 21 and 22. And then we might read some other things as we move forward. And um, if you don't have a Bible app or a bi physical Bible, um, we'll have it here on the screen. So it says here, no descendant of Aaron who has a defect may approach the altar to present special gifts to the Lord. Since he has a defect, he may not approach the altar to offer food to his God. However, he may eat from the food offered to God, including the holy offerings and the most holy offerings. And I'm going to read one more verse. And some of you who are new to faith probably might not quite understand it. That's why I was hesitant to read it. But I think it's important that we read this verse because it's really going to give us some context about what we're going to talk about today. So here it says, yet because of his physical defect, he may not enter the room behind the inner curtain or approach the altar for this would defile my holy places. I am the Lord who makes them holy. In other words, they can gather on the outer parts, but they can't get into direct contact to the presence of God because of a defect. All right. Some of you guys are like, man, I got some defects. <laughs> That's all right. We got some answers for you today. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us today like only you know how, Father. If there is someone here who's been damaged because of life, damaged because of a relationship, maybe damaged because of a sickness, Lord, today, Lord, we ask, Lord God, that you would bring restoration over every single one of us, Lord, whether it be emotional, spiritual, or physical. We know, Lord, that you are able, and that's why we're here today, Father. Do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, tell somebody, I'm damaged, but I'm still good. As much as we don't want to admit this, all of us here in this room are attracted to damaged things. Especially when we can get a discount on it. <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody say facts. <laughs> we are attracted to the clearance section. We are attracted to the scratch and dent. And we often, at some point, allowed certain damaged things or, or damaged tendencies to seep in 
to different areas of our lives. There's so many things that have damaged us throughout the course of our lives. And, and sometimes for some of us, maybe we've experienced damage in marriage and we've seen that firsthand and it, we've seen how it affected us as children. Uh, we've seen uh, the damage of dysfunctional relationships and some of us have seen the damage of physical sickness and ailments and, and how that affected us and maybe we had to take care of somebody along the way and maybe some of us have been damaged through a toxic relationship. And a lot of times we've been damaged through our own mistakes and our own failures. And sometimes we've been damaged because of the insecurities that others project on us, right? And so a lot of times because we've experienced damage, whether inflicted by someone else or self-inflicted, automatically we tend to gravitate towards damaged things and damaged people. On one occasion, 50 Cent was asked, why is so much of the youth culture attracted to your music? Now, if you know anything about his music, you would know that it's kind of street music. It has the experience of those who have lived the street life. And so it is not the most uplifting music, you know? And so, unless you're listening to In The Club or something like that. <laughs> I heard some people kind of nodding their head like, nah, some of that is not necessarily true, Pastor. <laughs> I'll pray for you. <laughs> but his response to this question was this. He says, youth culture loves things that are damaged by their experience. And I believe that that is so true that because of our experience of being damaged or as in the Bible puts it here, having some sort of defect, we tend to gravitate towards damaged things and damaged people. And so um, a lot of times we, we end up in sort of jacked up relationships because of it, because we often feel like we can relate to them because of our own damage. Or sometimes we do it because we think we can fix somebody. But the reality is that the only one that can restore and fix is Christ. Amen. Don't get into a relationship because you're good at fixing things. Fixing stuff is totally different than fixing people. People have free will something that many objects in cars do not have. And so a lot of times we end up actually paying more for stuff that we thought we were going to get a discount on. That's happened to me. You know, I, I, up until probably about 10, 12 years ago, I used to love buying cars that were crashed. I used to love buying auction vehicles. I just got a kick out of fixing and restoring cars, and then getting a good deal out of it. The last car that I fixed, and I did that way, um, it was hit, but the thing about it, it wasn't hit that bad. It was actually just like a fender, and I was like, this is not a big deal. Like, I'm, I could have this $30,000 car for like eight or $9,000. And um, I ended up purchasing the vehicle, I fixed the vehicle, the car looked so nice, it was so pretty, but the thing about it is that it had a serious electrical problem, where while I was driving, like literally, the radio would shut off and come back on again, the air conditioning would come on, and I tried to diagnose this thing so many different ways, and finally I was able to diagnose it. I had to go and buy some part, like somewhere in Boston, and I just had to go like on this whole mission to get this car right, and so we had it installed, and I remember the part name was called like a harness or something, and it had all these electrical wires running through it, but the car was never really right 100%. You know, because at the end of the day, it was, the vehicle was damaged. And when I really sat down and did the numbers, I calculated the numbers, and it really came out to more than if I would have just bought the car just ready to go right off the lot. You know? And so a lot of times, 
we think that we can get a discount because something is damaged. And sometimes we're in the other role where because of the damages of life, we tend to discount ourselves. Because I've been damaged by sexual immorality, maybe I can discount myself and accept lower than what God says that I am. And I want to remind someone here today that you might have been damaged, but God says you're still good. You're still good. There's a million reasons why many of us are attracted to damaged people. And sometimes we relate to them. Sometimes it allows us to cope with our own brokenness. And a lot of times we think we can fix them. And God is also attracted to damaged people. But not the same reasons that you and I are attracted to damaged things and damaged people. God is attracted to them not because he necessarily relates to their damage, because God is perfect. There is nothing imperfect about our God. But God is attracted to damaged people because he wants to restore them. And not only that, but he's willing to pay a hefty price. He's a matter of fact, he, he's wi willing to pay over MSRP. Because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You have to understand, this was a huge risk to be separated from his son. God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in this moment that he sends his son as ransom for our restoration and our healing, he is taking a huge risk in doing so, but he calculates and counts the costs and says, they are worth it. They are worth it. I want to restore them to their original value. I want to restore them to who I created them to be in the beginning. And so, we see here in this scripture, in Leviticus, where anyone who had some sort of defect was disqualified from coming in. And now, he speaks specifically here about the sons of Aaron. And the reason why he speaks about the sons of Aaron is because the sons of Aaron were the ones who had the opportunity to be able to serve as priests and minister in the presence of God. However, if they had any sort of physical defect or disability, they were automatically disqualified. It didn't matter if it was inflicted upon them. It didn't matter if it was self-inflicted. Regardless of how may it, it may have happened, their damage or their defect automatically disqualified them from serving in their priestly duties. And this might seem harsh. It might seem harsh. But what I want to do here today is show you how far we are from God without Jesus. How difficult it is to come into his presence without Jesus. How difficult it is to come into relationship with God without Jesus. Because I could just imagine how some of us felt when we read that scripture and it said anyone with a defect. Because right away we thought about our particular defect. We thought about certain areas where we may have been damaged that automatically disqualified us from serving in the presence of God, from having access to the presence of God. And, and, and this is why I love 
this particular passage in Luke chapter 5 because it shows us the picture of someone who has been disqualified. It shows us someone who has a physical appearance, a defect. And look at what it says here in Luke chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. It says, while he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus on his face, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And look at what happens here. It says, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, touch him saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. So Jesus goes into this village and he encounters this man with leprosy. And the Bible is very specific here because it doesn't just say he has some leprosy. He has a mild case of leprosy. He is fully covered with leprosy. In other words, what this tells us is there's different sort of levels of leprosy. There's leprosy that you can hide. That you could walk around with a long jacket and a sweater and some long pants and, and you can cover it up where people can't see it. And you might be able to slide in and connect with people and um, hang out with certain people. Because in those times, if you had leprosy, you were not allowed to be around people. You had to remain isolated. You, you had to be, remain in the same community of people who had the same issue of leprosy because they were afraid that you could contaminate other people, that you could spread it to other people. And so you had to stay separate. And it, it's, it's, it's very difficult trying to be able to live your life or make a living but not be able to connect with people not to be able to be around people. And so it was difficult maybe for you to make a living. And this is why a lot of times throughout the Bible, we see that lepers are relegated to becoming beggars throughout the Bible. There were people who depended on other people's uh, kindness and compassion to be able to survive because they weren't allowed to do so many different things. And so maybe if your case wasn't so severe, you could kind of get away with trying to slide into somebody's DM and nobody really noticing you having these issues. But he was fully covered, so he couldn't hide these issues that he had. And so this would have been hard for him to meet new people. This would have been hard for him to make a living. And one of the things that leprosy does is that it disfigures a person. It disfigures your limbs. It disfigures your feet. And, and the other thing that happens is that you lose the ability to sense pain because your pain receptors begin, begin to die because of this infirmity. In other words, you can be attacked. You, something can happen and you're not even noticing it. Your hand can catch on fire. You don't even notice it. And, and there are sometimes people like that, that they've dealt with spiritual leprosy in such a way that they don't even feel pain anymore because they've been fully covered by it. And so this man was fully covered. He didn't have the luxury of hiding his defects. And even though he was damaged and he had this defect, he still saw Jesus. He still saw Jesus. He might have been damaged, but he didn't want to say, he didn't want to stay damaged. Because, see, some people, they're damaged. And they accept it as something they have to live with the rest of their lives. Some people take it on in their personality. Some people take it on, you know, in so many different ways. And so a lot of us even 
think that we're born with this defect. And as a matter of fact, every single one of us is born with a defect. Way before we've experienced any pain. Every single one of us is born with a defect that keeps us from having a nearness to God that we all desire. And that defect goes way beyond our family lineage. It goes way beyond the craziness of your grandfather, your uncle, or your mama. It goes all the way back to the garden. It goes all the way back to one man. I know we try to blame it on Eve, but it wasn't her fault. We got a man up. Bible says it. It says because of one man. It doesn't say because of one couple. It says because of one man. Look at what it says here in Romans chapter 5 verse 12, just in case some of the fellas don't believe me. It says when Adam sinned, the entire world was affected. Sin entered human experience and death was the result. And so death followed this sin, casting its shadow over all humanity because all has sinned. Because of him, his one sin, all of us were affected by this one sin. One man introduced this thing called sin that actually separates us from God and, and separates us from the blessings of God, which is eternal life. God did not create you to have a limited life. He didn't create you to live for 80 years and die. He didn't create you to die. That wasn't his intention. His intention was to live exactly the way that he lives eternally. He created us in his image and his likeness. He is an eternal God. He has no beginning and he has no end. And his purpose for us was not to have an end. In these last two and a half years, we've noticed how short life can be. Some of us don't even have the blessing of 80 to 90 years. And it was all introduced through one man. But I love God because the story doesn't end with that one man. Because God also introduces another man into our story. And in it, he risks it all. Look at what it says here in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. Yes, Jesus. The sin that he committed, Adam, was great, but even greater is the grace of God. So maybe many of us have walked, many, many of us have walked our entire lives kind of like these men with these defects who I'm like, I'll hang out with some Christian people. I'll be around some Christian people. I'll eat with some Christian people. But I can't see myself entering into the presence of God because of the damages, because of the defects that I have, maybe because of an abuse that I've experienced. But I want to let you know that there is someone who fixes that defect, who overrides whatever the enemy has said about you that you don't have to be discounted that God restored your value on the cross through Christ Jesus says, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it there's the condition we have to be willing to receive it for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. I could imagine that this leper on many occasions tried to get help for this condition. He tried to get medical help. He tried to get 
someone to prescribe him something to cure him from this disease, but rather than it getting better, it actually got worse. In other words, he, it's not like he wasn't trying. Some of us, it's not like you haven't been trying. We've we just been going to the wrong sources. We've just been going to the wrong places. We've just been going to the wrong people. But if we would just go to the right one, some of us would be made whole again. Because every single one of us, we've experienced some sort of damage in our lives. The question is, will you accept it as the final verdict? Will you live your life as a damaged person? Some of us walk around our lives, our entire lives, because of one failure or one mistake, thinking that we are damaged goods, and so therefore we're not worthy to be accepted at full value. Maybe, maybe if I diminish my identity, they'll accept me or receive me. Maybe if I diminish who I am, maybe if I'm willing to accept verbal abuse, maybe if I'm willing to accept physical abuse, maybe they'll accept me. But, but I, I wanna let you know today that when Jesus restores you, he doesn't restore you at half value, at three quarters value. He restores you to 100%. And so this man asks Jesus, if you can. In other words, there are many people I've approached and they probably tried, but they couldn't. But if you can, if you can, some of us just need to have a if you can faith. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm going to give Jesus an opportunity. I, I, I'm not quite sure about this church thing and this gathering thing and, and getting together in small groups, but I'm going to give Jesus an opportunity. I know that people are flawed. I know that people will make mistakes. I know that people will mess up, but I know Jesus is perfect. So he says, if you can, please heal me. You know, he, he came with humility to Jesus. We know that because when he saw Jesus, he fell. In other words, it was a symbol of worship. It was a symbol of honor unto Jesus, of recognizing Jesus' power and Jesus' authority. And a lot of us just need to just start from a place of worship. Start from a place of surrender so that he can do what only he can do. And the Bible says here that Jesus touched him. Jesus touched him. Now the Greek word for this word touched is the word hapto. The word hapto means to set on fire. To, to light up. To light up. In other words, his light had been darkened because of this defect, because of this damage that had been in his life. And, and when, when you don't have that light within you, it's tough to have joy. It's tough to have peace. It's tough to have, be encouraged. But when Jesus touches you, the fire of God hits you in such a way that you are reinvigorated with peace. You are reinvigorated with hope. You are reinvigorated with the righteousness of God. And I, I want to encourage somebody who maybe has gotten into a dark place in your life that if you would just ask him to touch you, it will be a fire lit up inside of you that your light will be able to shine again. And, and people will ask you, what is that? light that's inside of you. I need some of that light on the inside of me. And he was made whole because that's what Jesus does. Now, when he makes you whole, it doesn't mean that every single thing in your life is going to be perfect. When he makes you whole, that means he makes you complete. 
regardless of the things in your life that are not complete, regardless of the things in your life that are still unfinished, because we are a process. We are on our way towards perfection. And so as we walk with Christ, we're constantly taking next steps. We're not just waiting to God to t- for God to touch us again. We're constantly making next steps so that we can continue to get better and we can continue to grow in Christ and we can continue to mature in our walk with him. But we don't see ourselves as someone who's just damaged. We see ourselves as someone who is restored. This is why it's called restoration worship in the front of the church. Because you can come to him damaged, but you don't have to stay damaged. Staying damaged is a choice. Some of us didn't have a choice when we were damaged. But staying damaged, that's a choice that we have to make for ourselves. Let us be on our feet. If today this word has ministered to your heart, If today you feel like, man, I've been walking around damaged with a damaged heart and a damaged mindset, and I thought that I had to live like this the whole rest of my life. And maybe, maybe, maybe some of us have accepted the restoration and wholeness of God, but sometimes there's memories that come up again. There's reminders that that come up again. And uh, I got something for that because sometimes, you know, there's reminders that come up on my phone and I have to just be like, I already took care of this, so I'm going to turn this reminder off because I don't need to be reminded about this anymore because this has already been dealt with. And some of us need to turn off those reminders in your mind that keep on telling you about your past and keep on reminding you about your pain and keep on reminding you about the resentment. Some of us just need to go home and just reset those reminders and turn those off because it's it's been dealt with on the cross. It's been dealt with through Christ Jesus. Jesus. 